Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Walt Bartman. I'm the director of the Yellow Barn Studio in Glen Echo, and we're um, interviewing one of our top instructors, uh, Gavin Glakis, this morning. Uh, this is your opportunity to get to know Gavin and uh, perhaps maybe take classes from Gavin. And I think that, uh, you know, what you hear today, I think, will inspire you to uh, consider taking uh, classes and, and um, you know, developing yourself as an artist. So good morning, Gavin. How are you? Good morning, Walt. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you. And, I, you know, we've been working together for many years. I don't know. Uh, can you figure out what how many years it's been? I, you know, I hate to tell you this. I hate I, I don't know if you've done this math, but I think this is year 30. Really, really, third. I think so. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate to have you as my teacher in high school, and I don't think I had you freshman year, but I think that sophomore year is when we started working together, and that would have been about thirty years ago. So yeah. uh, we've known each other a long time, and um, uh, not only did you, uh, I, I have you to thank for so much of um, my career, but not only did you teach me how to draw and teach me how to paint and give me some some lessons that were really, really important that I carry with me to this day, which I'm happy to get into. Um, but you've also, it's kind of at every stage of my development, not just high school, but also college. I didn't study art in college. And then I wanted to get into the art program when I was a senior. And um, you helped me take pictures of my work and you helped me put together a portfolio. And then when I got out of college, I was trying to figure out how I could possibly become an artist rather than a lawyer. You know, you invited me to come over to Tillman and we sat on your dock and we had a beer and we talked about life and how I was going to do that. And then when I started my um, career as an artist, once I made a, you know, a very, very little headway, um, yeah, you invited me to come teach at the Yellow Barn and uh, I've been there ever since. And so at every stage um, of my career and development, you have been there to help me and to guide me. And uh, you've really been a mentor and even more than that. So I thank you for everything. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, when I look at uh, the careers of uh, students that I've had, you're one of the ones that's really, um, really achieved a lot. And I think that we're going to see today uh, the quality of your work and the discipline and the uh, dedication that you have to it. Uh, you know, all the hard work that it takes to get where you are. I think this is one of the most important things when we look at your work. So um, what I'm going to ask you now is how did you start uh, painting what was it that uh, must have gone back uh, long before me so i want to know what uh... well i've been drawing um since i was a little kid and i love to draw and it was always my favorite thing to do and um i started kind of experimenting with paint in junior high because i loved animation and i loved illustration and um i started sort of feebly on my own uh not even painting on canvas but creating animation cells and, and trying to paint the type of backgrounds that I would see in animated movies and not making any progress. Um, and uh, the way I began painting is basically you made me. I mean, when I got to Whitman, I loved art and I loved to draw. And um, I went into the art program and they basically said, now you're going to paint. And I sort of thought to myself, paint? Like I'd never really, it never really occurred to me to paint before. And um, Fortunately, I had come across a book of Norman Rockwell's work uh, at one of my uncle's houses where I used to stay in the summer. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever seen anything that made me want to paint. This is, this is in seventh or eighth grade. And um, painting was hard at first, baby. I mean, it was so hard that whole first year. I mean, every day in art class, you know, so five days a week for nine months or whatever. Um, it didn't really take and I just sort of forced my way through it because I wanted to understand it. I wanted to, I'd always, art had always been such a big part of my life and I, I didn't want to discount this major element of creativity uh, without even giving it a shot. And it wasn't until that next year, until when I was a sophomore, um, that it kind of started to take and I started getting really excited about it. And, um, and I started at least understanding what I was trying to do. Um, and I found some painters that I really loved. I, 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 you, again, took us to the National Gallery a few weeks into my um, painting endeavors when I was a freshman. And uh, there was a Frederick Church show, which just, just lit my world on fire. And by that point, I'd fallen in love with the great masters. And um, I was just spellbound at what they were able to do with the same materials that I had. 
I couldn't see any connection between what I was doing and what they were doing, but they were allegedly the same materials. These were thinking, living, breathing human beings who in some cases weren't that much older than me. I figured there had to be a get to, there had to be a way to get from where I was at least to the point where I could understand what they were doing. Um, and uh, that is how I started painting in the first place. And uh, like, it, it just started to make sense for me as, as a way to look at the world and as a way to um, explore sort of the things that I'm enthusiastic about and take the experiences and the thoughts that I have and kind of make something of them rather than have them just disappear once they're over. Uh, it seemed like the best vehicle for me. Yeah, and then you went on, you went on to, uh... Uh, college. You, uh, I think you went to Washington University in St. Louis for a while. Yeah, I did. I chickened out uh, when it was time to apply to college. I was planning to go to art school and um, I just chickened out. Enough people told me that you can't make a living as an artist. You and my mom and dad were the three people who told me to do it. And um, I met some really successful artists who just looked me in the eye and said, do not do it. You can't do it. You can't make a living. Um, and so I decided that I'd go to college and get a, you know, get a degree and then probably go to law school. Um, and, uh, that was the path I was on until I got into a painting program in London, my uh, junior year. And I went and painted in London for six months. And this is going to be a, um, a refrain. You <laughs> factored into that too. I'm sure you don't remember this, but we ran into each other in Canterbury Cathedral. I was yeah. I was <laughs> hanging around with a bunch of friends and we were walking through the cathedral and ran right into you. Yeah. And you and I went the next day to the gallery and we walked through there and I was I I, I had given up on art. Um, it wasn't that I wasn't pursuing it. It was that I had decided that I was not going to pursue it. Um, and it was a it, it it was just a terrible feeling the first few years of college. So um, I got back into it over there and. Um, I wound up minoring in art in college, but then after college, I um, I got a job and I took the LSATs and I was working for um, a couple of years before I decided that I really, um, I just had to do this. This was something that I wouldn't be able to live with myself if, um, if I didn't at least attempt to do this before declaring failure. So um, I stopped working on Capitol Hill. I got a job working in an art gallery um, I started taking classes and uh, within a year, the gallery was uh, showing my work and selling my work and getting me commissions. And it was a very roundabout way to, um, to you know, get started with my career. But I think that a lot of people in creative endeavors have very roundabout ways. I think a lot of people go to art school and then get MFAs and then become artists. But I think a lot of other people, you know, tend to go in, uh, in different routes. So that's how I did it. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that impresses me about you is uh, when you make a decision, uh, you, you really go after it and you don't, uh, you know, you don't question yourself. You really have the confidence to be successful at whatever you're going to do. And I think, that, you know, that, that this is one of the things that I think, uh, I think you share with your students. And I think that's why they're committed and you have such a great following. Um, Thank we're going to go to your work now. Okay. okay. We're going to go and take a look at what you've done. And I'm just going to ask you uh, a little bit about it. The first uh, image you should be seeing coming up uh, here. Let's see. Um, uh, you see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go to the, uh, the slideshow and uh, play from the start. And of course, okay. um, I, what I would like you to talk a little bit about is what's your work about? And what do you think is uh, important? And we can kind of scroll down through these. Let me go quickly just through these, just to, so people can see a little bit about the body of work that you submitted. Yeah, I think that there are some commissioned portraits. There are some um, non-commissioned, just figure paintings and drawings um, that I've done. And then um, some cityscapes and landscapes. Uh -huh. And uh, talk a little bit about what, what interests you. Uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in, um, it's really sort of a vehicle for me to explore the things that I'm interested in and kind of, um, you know, make a kind of take really fleeting experiences and germs of half hidden thoughts and, and ideas that are completely intangible 
and try to make something concrete out of it um, to sort of solidify, um, you know, some of these intangible um, just feelings that, that uh, I encounter in my life. And um, I tend to be um, interested in um, really finding the, the positive and the exciting and the, the um, just the, the really kind of wonderful aspects of being alive. Um, it, it's, it's partly a, a, a vehicle for me to um, kind of maintain my op optimism and my excitement and, and the, uh, the sort of energy that I had uh, when I was a kid and I was so excited about things and so interested in things and I really wanted to learn about things. I really wanted to do things and, um, and not give in to, to any levels of um, cynicism or, um, or uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of everydayism, um, but rather to, uh, to take the best aspects of, of life and try to um, experience them and share them with other people. Well, you know, and I'm looking at this, you know, what really impresses me, Gavin, after working with you, uh, one is your personal discipline, which I think is really the strength of your character. All right. Thank you. And I think the um, uh, when I look at your work and I think in terms of like the Harry Reid portrait and just the pressures that would be on your back to produce a piece of work that you knew was going to be viewed by some of the most important people in the United States and um, and for you to put yourself into it and to reach the kind of level that you did here with the work, this is not easy, all right? And, and you know, just I can speak from experience. So when I take a look at what you've done here and, um, and the challenge that you accepted, I really uh, can tell you, I mean, this is a, a when, when an artist is working, the discipline to really make an idea, uh, you know, successful, I mean, in, in all ways, uh, is a challenge. And I think you did a great job here. But maybe Thank you can you. speak a little bit about that with this particular portrait. Thank you. Um, this was really, uh, I was really excited about this throughout the process. Uh, it was it was just an incredible process for me to do this. And um, I, I really, really feel fortunate that, um, that I was asked to do this and that I was able to do it and that it turned out in a way that I'm really proud of. Um, Senator Reed was very generous with his time. He, we started working on this um, after he had decided to retire. Uh, it was in 2016. It was in the spring and summer that we probably started working on it. And um, yeah, he was probably one of the three or four busiest people in Washington at the time, but um, he seemed to be really, really interested in art and in the creative process. One of the first conversations we had um, uh, when I undertook the commission was that he started showing me some of the paintings in his office. And um, some of them were on loan from the National Gallery, but some of them he had bought when he was really young and didn't have any money. And he sort of said to himself, you know, I may not have much money now, but I'm, I'm, this is an investment in my future and this will motivate me to go out and work really hard and, you know, one day. And, and here we are 50 years later and he's showing me the painting on his office. He's asking me all kinds of questions about, um, about being an artist and how you paint. He's telling me about different artists that he's been friends with over the years. And he gave me uh, eight, I don't want to say two hour blocks on Sundays uh, throughout the course of that summer for us to work on this painting. And what we would do is uh, his staff would bring in a TV and he would, we'd always uh, schedule our sittings around times that the Nationals were playing. He liked baseball and um, he'd watch baseball and I would, I first sketched and then I painted and, uh, but we'd talk a lot and we really got to know each other. And I started to feel really comfortable around him um, and could just, I, I could say to him, do you mind if I ask you a political question? I'd ask him questions and he'd just answer them. And we developed a really nice friendship. Um, I spent three or four days sketching out different, uh, you know, positions and you know, fixing the, changing the lights and is the light going to look good here? And um, and then I did a um, 
uh, study of his face, so a portrait of uh, his head and shoulders. And then I spent the last few days, and I did, painted a lot of this in my studio, but um, I spent the last few days um, tuning up details. And I wanna say that I painted his hands uh, completely from life to the point that um, the last election in November of 2016 was on a Tuesday, obviously. Um, I spent that Tuesday working on, I think his right hand, the one with the pen. And then I went home that night and watched the election. And then the next day was Wednesday. And then the next day was Thursday. And I was uh, scheduled to go into his office to work on it. And I went in and he, that was the day. It's probably the second day I would assume. But uh, when I was sitting there that he was making his phone calls to um, all the people in Washington and around the world uh, to discuss the ramifications of the election when Trump um, won the election and was elected president. And a couple of times he asked me to leave the room, which I was always happy to do. And he would, a lot of the times when we were working, he would be having meetings with his staff and there'd be three or four people sitting there and I'd be sitting there painting, you know, and they're all sitting there. And occasionally he'd ask me to leave the room if they were gonna talk about something sensitive. But um, it was just a fascinating place to be. And, um, I wanted to depict him. I'm talking a lot about this painting, but this painting means a lot. No, to no, me. that's great that we have this. I think that's really important. Uh, I think anybody who's watching this video really wants to know a lot about you and how you think. And this is a great way of understanding what you're about. So go ahead. Um, thank you. I um, There were a couple things in this that I really wanted to highlight. And, and there were two major things that I wanted to highlight. Um, and for, so first, order to so the way that I do this in order to highlight it is we, we to the extent that we talk about it and plan it out which with some sitters is more and with some sitters is less just depending on their personalities um, we discuss this and then uh, in many cases especially like this uh, I'll show them a full charcoal sketch of the painting so that we can all be on the same page and they can say yes I like this uh, let's do it you know before moving on it's just um, just to make sure that we all understand what the painting is going to look like before I put a ton of time into it um, but the things that I wanted to highlight in this were one that he is a very hard worker. This is a man who grew up in a house without indoor plumbing um, in a tin shack in the desert in Nevada, who had to walk something like 15 miles to get to high school and he would stay there all week and then he'd walk home on the weekends, uh, who worked his way through law school as a uh, Capitol Hill policeman uh, and became the Senate Majority Leader of the United States. Um, this guy works hard. And so I wanted to depict him working. I didn't want him standing there, you know, with the sun on his face in front of the flag. I wanted to depict him sitting at his desk working. And he had said to me, you know, when I first say, I say, well, I have plenty of ideas about the portrait, but I'd love to hear what ideas you have first. And he said something along the lines of, I just want to, I want to include the desk. The desk is where I sit. The desk is where I work. This is where I legislate. And, um, this is where I've spent my time. And, and I took that to mean um, that he's basically spent his time working, you know, rather than at, at the, the cocktail parties and the glad handing and the, the baseball games and everything like that. So I wanted to depict him behind the desk, sitting down, working. As it happens, this desk in the US Capitol was Andrew Johnson's desk when he was uh, Abraham Lincoln's vice president. That's how old it is and that's the, the history of it. I happen to love history myself as part of the reason why I do this. The, um, so I thought that made perfect sense. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do, so that was one, I wanted to depict him sitting down working. The other was by the time I actually started, um, I had gotten a, a, a good sense of who he is as a person and um, He's a very sweet, very kind, very generous um, man. And if you saw him on the news or if you, you know, read about him in the paper, um, or if you sat down and spoke to some of his colleagues from across the aisle, that may not be uh, the sense that one would get initially. You know, he's been called a fighter and he was a boxer when he was young and he was always, that was, you know, the sort of pugilistic aspect of his public persona is the one that I think people are familiar with. But I found him to be a very sweet, very kind person. And um, I wanted to depict that as well. So that is um, how I went about doing this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, uh, 
you know, like I said, you had to, um, a deadline to work with and things like that, I'm sure. And that, yeah. was, that was your challenge. Okay. Yeah. And it, <laughs> and it was, and to get I it love right. the challenge. Okay. I mean, you know, none of us, we're all artists, you know, we don't do this because we don't like a challenge. So, no. um, uh, I love there, the challenge. So it was exciting. Is there any, uh, anything specific about this painting that you can speak about compositionally or things like that, that you might. Yeah. Have? I loved the, um, it, it took me a lot of different thumbnails in my sketchbook to figure out where he would be, where I would be, where the lights would be. I loved that uh, cool backlighting. We've got a, um, I, I've got a spotlight shining on the right side of his, his face, you know, um, and then there's a window open to the left. Um, and that's where that cool backlighting down the side of his head and uh, his arm and the desk are. And um, I love that aspect of it. I love that effect. And I thought that it would um, work really well. And even um, on his hands, uh, you know, we get a sense of that. And it, it just adds to the color and the three dimensionality and gives it a, it, for me, a, um, a sense of, um, you, you know, a contemporary feel. I, I want my paintings to feel like uh, they exist today and are relevant for people, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. people who, um, who exist in a world with movies and the internet and everything like that. I try, um, I, I, I paint in a way that means something to me now today in 2021. I'm, I'm not trying to paint something that looks old fashioned mm -hmm. um, uh, or create something that looks old fashioned. Um, uh, although I'll tell you a funny story about this. So I finished the painting. I brought it in to show to my class at the Yellow Barn. I thought they'd be really excited to see it. I've been talking about it for months uh, and they were, they were great. They were really excited to see it. And uh, a really good friend of mine who, um, who has been taking my class for a number of years, pulled me aside after I was talking about it, when everybody got back, um, she, she said, Gavin, can I talk to you uh, in the other room? I'm like, yeah, sure. She said, listen, it's about the painting. And she very sort of sheepishly and kind of um, quietly said, I think there's a problem with the chair. And I said, really? Okay. And um, she said, can I tell you? And I sort of kind of, you know, Sure, I'd love to hear your opinion. Please tell it to me. And uh, there had been behind his head, underneath his ear, um, there is some ornamentation that's part of that chair. I don't think I've told anybody this before. Uh, although a whole bunch of people in my classroom uh, <laughs> saw it happen, so it's not a secret. And um, she said, we can't understand what that is from across the room. And I said, oh, it's part of the chair. And she said, I know, but from across the room, it's really hard to understand. It looks like he has a ponytail. I thought, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at it that way and it looked like that. And so I took it out immediately. Um, and uh, I was actually having a conversation with a student recently about how, uh, unfortunately, I picked a, a career um, where almost every piece of advice I ever get from anybody is valid. And um, I, I've, I've, as much as I would love to go, hey, who's the painter here? I got this one under control. Uh, it's it's very helpful you know, to keep your ears open while wandering around the world. So um, compositionally, uh, it was a struggle to make that desk interesting enough to make sense. Um, but I thought between the reflection and the ornamentation on the left, uh, uh, it would work, but it took a while to get there. Yeah. Well, it worked out beautifully for you, and I think the um, Thank you. you know the uh, the piece speaks. Uh, you know, it's a profound piece in the body of your work, uh, and so uh, do you feel it's one of the, uh, the the strongest portraits that you've painted, or how do you feel about I, it? I certainly feel that way. I'm I'm very happy with the way it turned out, and uh, yeah. I was pushing myself as hard as I could on every kind of every aspect of this, and uh, I knew that I didn't want to be you know, you're always making progress. You're always learning. You're always better than you were two weeks ago. You know, you, I never want to look at a painting I did years ago and say, well, I haven't learned anything since then, you know, I yeah. haven't improved at all. At the same time, I, when I was painting this, I, you know, a big part of me was going, this is really exciting. I'll get to bring my grandchildren down here one day and, and show them this. So uh, not that I, I don't push myself on everything, but I really, really was killing myself to kind of learn as much as possible and exceed my own expectations while painting this. Um, and I'm still happy with it. So let me ask you a question. How literal is this painting from the standpoint of his tie? Did you did you just go with the tie that he showed uh, up with? Or did you tell him what tie he had to wear? I, I wasn't going to tell him that I said, <laughs> I, I, there may have been conversations um, with I, I, I always I often have to remind people um, 
So, you know, just please remember that the things you're going to be wearing in, um, next Sunday are what you're, we're going to depict you in in the portrait. If there's a certain, I always say this. So, if there's a certain tie you'd like to wear, or um, you know, and I'm always hoping they don't bring plaid. Uh, if it's not plaid, it's fine. Well, this is what I this is what I was going to say to you. What if he had shown up with a tie that just wouldn't work in a portrait? <laughs> All right. Well, you know, then I would either have very gently said, um, I, a lot of times this actually, it, it, I, I know you're kind of joking, but this does happen a lot where you'll be confronted with a problem that's not going to work. The, the client or the sitter will say, hey, why don't we do this? And, um, and you'll have to feel comfortable enough to say to them, well, I tell you what, um, this is the reason why that's not going to work, whether it's the lighting or the composition or some other logistical thing um, uh, or the a sort of emotional feel about the way that it's going to read. Um, I do wind up saying to um, clients a lot, uh, this is why that's not going to work. And I try to explain it um, the way I try to explain things in class, which is as simply and as concisely as possible. And um, and I, I don't think I've ever had somebody try to overrule me. If something like that happens, and I and I at least explain to them, so I show them that there is logic and reason behind it. It's not the answer is never, I'm the artist and I know best and I'm a genius and and don't, you know let me take care of this. That's it. the answer is, well, because the light is warm and it's striking this, it's going to make this look garish. And if we put something in the background, then then it might work. But if we don't, you know, there's always some reasoning, and um, and the people are are, are responsive to it. Yeah, I just wondered how, if there was any story that uh, did you you know you you had about this particular piece, but it sounds to me like you had this right from the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Congressman Reed, and you um, really were um, uh, you know you could tell that you had that connection. Um, these are no, the I'll tell you what, when I was painting, and now we'll move on, but when I was painting his hands, we'd gotten to the point where we were comfortable enough with each other, and he is about as unselfconscious a person as I've ever encountered in my entire life. When I was painting his hands, um, he was making phone calls. So if I was painting his right hand, he'd be dialing with his left hand and talking on the phone with his left hand, <laughs> you know, and vice versa. And I would get up while he's holding the pencil, you know, he's holding the pen like this. I was comfortable enough with him, and he was, he was perfectly fine with it that I would get up and kind of go like yeah, that to him. <laughs> and he didn't <laughs> mind at all. Um, so anyway, okay. That's great. These are, these are great stories. I'm glad we can record this because it, it'll be important, you know? I so. And I think, uh, I think this is it. Uh, these are other pieces and uh, you can speak about these uh, relatively quickly. I think the thing that I would like to ask you, you know, if there were any uh, challenges or, um, you know, again, uh, you know, uh, what you think uh, somebody might want to know from each one of these pieces? Well, I'll make this quick. This was, I loved doing this one. I loved working on this one because this is a portrait of a gentleman named Stephen Ayers. He's the 11th architect of the U.S. Capitol. And um, he, uh, when I went in to meet him, understanding that I was going to paint his portrait and they were going to put it up in the Capitol, I realized that I was going to talk to somebody with an absolutely perfect and fully honed sense of design and composition and color and balance and all of the things that I worry so much about. I, I, I don't think I've ever painted anybody basically to make it, you know, to put it simply, who knows as much about art as I do. And, um, and uh, when I went in to talk to him, it wound up being this fascinating collaboration where uh, we both hit upon the idea. I've loved, I've always loved juxtaposing three-dimensional and two-dimensional images. You know, I love Gustav Klimt. I love, uh, I've all, that's always been um, where I've been coming from in my work. I love Asian art. I love Chinese art. I love medieval art. I've always uh, uh, seen a place for combining uh, three-dimensional and two-dimensional and Western and Eastern, et cetera. And so um, he came up with these, he found these designs for, um, parts of the Capitol that were done by one of his predecessors in the 19th century. And we combined them and, and this was really a collaboration. And uh, I very much valued his, um, his thoughts and input uh, while we were doing this painting. Mm -hmm. And that, that turned out well too. And I think the, uh, when we look at these, this is another one of your portraits that you wanted to share. Yeah, that is, um, she is a fascinating person. This is 
I had been um, commissioned to paint the first woman who uh, was ever, um, whose portrait was ever painted for Georgetown Medical School a few years ago, which was a real honor. And it was a really interesting process to learn all about her, but that was a posthumous portrait. This is the second one um, that Georgetown commissioned me to do. And this woman is uh, very much alive and uh, just a just the, one of the most interesting people um, I've ever met. And we spent a lot of time together while I was working on this portrait and we really got to be friends. Um, and uh, um, this portrait, she had mentioned that she loves Rembrandt and she loves his lighting. And I thought to myself, well, that's a fascinating problem to try and solve. How to how to try and um, give a sense of you know that the, the timelessness of a Rembrandt and the lighting and the feel of that, but in in a in a contemporary um, in a contemporary way that will feel alive to um, to all of the people who encounter it. And uh, it, she and I really uh, developed a nice friendship while I was painting this. Yeah, that, that worked out well too. And then this beautiful piece, this uh, drawing that you did here. Um, you know, this one, I, I know I'm very familiar with your work and when you uh, chose this to show, I always thought this was a, a really unique piece because of the, um, just the um, the emotion that was underlying the the turning the, of the head the way you did, uh, where the other ones are more, you know, portrait-like. Uh, this is uh, one where we're looking at the portrait in a totally different way. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is a model who I love working with. And the reason I love working with her is she just very intuitively takes poses like this. We just This is one of those weeks in the yellow barn where there was nobody around. It was in between sessions. And she and I just went in there and um, she, she just sat down and took this pose. Uh, I'd been wanting to kind of Her. And um, I, I've depicted her a few times, and uh, she she really did the work on this one, on uh, taking a really evocative pose. Mm -hmm. But these are the types of uh, drawings that um, uh, we do in class, where uh, it's really just um, a drawing is just the foundation for anything. I mean, if you can learn to draw, you can just take that and go anywhere you want with it in terms of materials and in terms of style and subject matter and. Um, these, the, the problems I had to solve here were the ones that we focus on in my classes and uh, they're the ones that I think are, are the most compelling. So that's what this is. So let me ask you a question. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a descriptive painter? Do you just see yourself as a colorist? Uh, what, what do you think when students are taking your classes, what do you think they're looking um, to get from you? Well, I try to give, I've always tried to give students um, the basics and the fundamentals and sort of the ability to go wherever they want with their work. You know, I've tried to give them the tools to just whatever path they want to uh, chart to be able to go on it. I mean, it, we all know how frustrating it is to have an idea and not be able to execute. And so I've tried to give them the tools to be able to execute. And um, I try to get a sense from them of where they're trying to go um, stylistically. And uh, I, I've, I've tried to just help them get there. So I personally am um, really interested in accurate drawing in uh, really vibrant um, color and and much more much more importantly in an overall feel and vibe um, and sort of atmosphere and communicating that really intangible atmosphere in and in a you know hopefully relatively um, believable way to the viewer well do you uh, think then that your strength is drawing do you think that that's your uh, I've always tried to uh, learn as much and improve as much and draw as accurately as possible because I feel, A, that um, that it is the foundation for everything. B, that if something isn't drawn accurately, it's just not believable. Now, I don't mean that it can't be exaggerated. You know, an artist like Klimt or, um, or Egon Schiele or somebody like that or El Greco or whoever may take something accurate and then exaggerate it push it and pull it and put their own stamp on it for, um, you know, their own emotional reasons. And that's something that I play with a lot. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody from El Greco to Norman Rockwell does that, but um, drawings that don't work, you know, that are inaccurate to me always feel like listening to the kid practicing the scale on the piano where they hit the wrong note. It's just completely jarring and distracting. 
And so I've always tried to focus on that as much in my work and try to communicate to my students as simply as possible. Here are the tangible things you can do to improve your drawing. It's not just magic and it's not just, you know, throwing the ball against the wall enough times that on the thousand and first time it's going to work. It's, it's if you take these steps, these very logical, rational steps that, that anybody can understand, uh, your drawing will improve and you, you'll, you will understand what you're trying to do. Um, so that's how I try to approach it. Okay. And I think that's, that definitely is your, uh, when I see your work and I know how you blend into our program at the Yellow Barn, I mean, that's the strength of, of your teaching is, uh, you know, that kind of uh, approach to seeing. And I think, uh, you. you know, it shows in your work and, and a piece like this particularly, uh, you know, communicates, I think, uh, a lot about what you, you can do. All right. Thank you. So, and then now we get to the landscapes, which I think are uh, interesting. This is a new direction for you in some respects. Uh, to yeah, I had never that. painted landscapes until um, until I was about thirty, and because I always wanted to be Frederick Church. Frederick Church was my hero, and um, and I would go out to paint landscapes, and I'd come in with a painting, you know, of a of a half finished clump of trees, and. 98% of my painting wouldn't even been touched. And it wasn't until I internalized all those things that we always talk about in our classes, work from generals to specific, you know, block in lights and shadows um, in, a, in a decisive and general way and work towards smaller elements and details. It wasn't until I really internalized that, uh, that I felt comfortable painting landscapes and that I did any that, that inspired me with enough confidence to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and, and so that was a big part of, of my landscape endeavors was just listening to, you know, all of those things that, that our teachers are always talking about. Well, what's interesting about this is the coolness of the, of the painting, the coolness of the temperature and then the warmth uh, that you get inside the building. You know, and you feel that you feel that the I love those. I love color out me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love playing with lighting conditions and color harmonies and that type of thing. It's something that I'm endlessly fascinated by. Um, and uh, whether it's portraits or landscapes or whatever, it's something that I'm constantly pushing and experimenting with and failing and succeeding. And it, it's something that I really am interested well, in. What's interesting about the landscapes is that they're very, we, we, would, call them, we would call these romantic paintings. In other words, they have that kind of uh, quality that you get uh, when we uh, feel the uh, kind of um, uh, emotion that I feel uh, this time of day gives you, all right? That's yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, try to, I try to take life and find the things in it that um, are really interesting to me, you know, and really push those things. So and, why did you choose the cityscapes or, or uh, the all the cars or the gas station, things like that? What was... Uh, the reasoning behind that? Well, um, I, I've always felt like we all, you know, I love nature. I love painting landscapes. I live in the woods. I've kind of always lived in the woods. Um, and um, I, I, I've always found nature beautiful, but I've always found humanity beautiful too. I've, I've always found the things that we make and the things that we study and the things that um, we've built and, and the music and the literature and, uh, and, and, our accomplishments um, to be worthy of praise. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of negativity to humanity. We, we tear things down, but we build things up. And, and if we can, you know, if we can focus on the building up rather than the tearing down, then maybe, you know, maybe we'll have done something. So that's what's drawn me to paint humanity rather than um, strictly nature. And um, it, with something like this, they're, they're, I, um, I, I love history and I love, I love elements of, of kind of the continuity of human existence that are still found today, you know, whether it's a, in a really historically rich city like London or Rome, or even in a place like Austin, Texas, this is where my brother lives, this is two blocks from his house, and, um, you, you know, something that feels vibrant and modern and alive and used by living people, but also that might be a window into our past. You know, I'm not painting period scenes with horses and buggies and that type of thing. Um, but this might be, you know, for me at least, uh, an, an, an interesting way to remind myself that human nature doesn't change and that it, 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 it you know, we march on and we learn new things, but that humanity um, 
you know, struggles with the same things generation after generation. And that's, uh, I also love mid-century modern architecture and, and the whole feel of that. Um, so that's what kind of led me to find a place like this interesting enough to paint. Yeah, the, the, and you know, it, when you painted this one, I it, it was it was a surprise. All right, so it, it, it's very interesting to see a, a, a different subject. Uh, and I'm familiar with your cityscapes, but uh, this was a, a, a more unusual one. This and was then, really fun for me, the composition. Yeah, and then you uh, this this uh, beautiful piece here with the uh, large clouds. Uh, um, you know, this is another one where you're talking about scale relationships. You know. Um, do you take more risks as a landscape painter than you do as a portrait painter? I can't separate them. Um, I, I sort of approach them the same way. Um, uh, I, I do take a lot of risks as a, a portrait painter. It's just that I sort of <laughs> I kind of explain them to the clients first. Um, you know, I'll talk to the collector and say, hey, listen, I have this idea and I really think it's going to work. And if it's if if they don't say, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it. If they say anything other than that, I'll do a study to show them, go, okay, remember that idea I had? This is how I think it would go. And they either go, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it. Or they'll go, uh, you know, why don't we think about doing something else and then we'll do something else. So um, in a lot of situations, I have been able to really push those things with portraits. Um, in a lot of, you know, in a lot of them I haven't, but then I'll just do them in my own work um, yeah. anyway. So it's not like that door is closed. Well, this, um, this seems to me like the, um, uh, you know, when we look at, um, say, um, uh, Winslow Homer, or we look at uh, uh, John Singer Sargent, there are times when they're painting for themselves. Yeah. And you get that feeling in your landscapes. Well, you thank know, the you. Portraits, the portraits definitely, you know, you're being commissioned. So right. you really have that to, to deal with. But I think that that's the, I, I was just thinking to myself, is this more liberating for you to paint the, 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 uh, the, you know, the cityscape or whatever. It, I mean, I really love that part of painting. I love that part about painting landscapes and just being able to kind of take reality as like my barest starting point and then just springboard off of that and see where we're going to wind up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I color, love that aspect of color, it. Color seems to dominate more in these pieces. In other words, you you have the, um, the relationships of, of some pretty strong colors in your palette, you know, yeah. where they, uh, you know, here you're getting a, a real interesting uh, a feel between, between the combination of that color of the sky and what you've done with the lighting below. So, uh, you know, you've done this masterfully. I think uh, now we're going to get to the these last two, which I think uh, their departures from portraiture for sure. Um, you know, they seem to be like you experimenting more. All right, uh, with things. So maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, um, I don't get a chance to paint that many just purely experimental figure paintings, but when I do, um, boy, do I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I just, I have these, these really, really, you know, intangible feelings and thoughts and memories and, and kind of, uh, you know, things in the deepest recesses of my mind, which I can barely, uh, barely find. And um, I, I think it's just so fascinating to try to take those just wisps of ideas that are in there from childhood and try to make them into something concrete today, you know, as an adult with all of this ground up pigment and linseed oil and brushes. And um, man, I had the time of my life on this one. And uh, it's, it's, it's as much as, you know, I was interested with the explosiveness of the paint quality, a big part of this is just the um, the kind of flow and balance of the composition and of the three dimensional versus two dimensional space that I was really fascinated by, and um, uh, I this was lots of fun. Yeah, and and you can see, you know, your uh, uh, you know this you're departing from just uh, a more of a descriptive element uh, where you're using here the paint a little bit more abstractly. And, uh, and intuitively, especially with the background, you handle that in a way that uh, creates a contrast between that and you know, the, uh, the focus in the painting. Uh, the next one, uh, and this is our last one, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Wanna to speak to this one and then? 
Yeah, a lot of times I'll have an idea of something and then I'll have to go out and find the props. So with this one, I just love the, um, I, I love that effect of vibrant sunlight up against dark storm clouds. I mean, I think that it's so powerful. It only happens every once in a while. Um, and uh, so I wanted to depict that. So then I went, all right, well, what am I gonna do now? So um, she is the same model as the one earlier that we were talking about. And uh, she had posed with her hair looking like that in one of my classes. And so I, I uh, set a time for her to come pose in my studio. And I said, please don't do anything to your hair. I love your hair. Uh, let's please keep it that way. And then, so I started the painting before I knew what I was gonna do with the background. Cause I only had a very limited amount of time to paint this, it's really big. I had her coming, I don't know, four or five times and I hadn't figured out what the proper setting would be. I wanted it some, to be something, um, something kind of, you know, uh, you know, reminiscent of, of the, of kind of almost an almost kind of rural blue collar 1950s type of feel. I mean, that is what was calling to me about this painting for reasons that I'm not quite sure and uh, but that I discovered later. Um, and so I was trying to think of where I would go, you know, I was thinking about places around here that might have, like that old garage in Texas near my brother's place, you know, where could I find that? And I'm, in my mind, I was going through different places and kind of, well, it's not going to work, you know. And then I realized that the neighborhood I grew up in, in Cabin John, this is the Cabin John Gardens, mm -hmm. this is where I grew up. It's just on the Potomac side of the one lane bridge, um, you know, five minutes from Glen Echo. I thought that, that's what I'm looking for. That's exactly what I want. So I went there and I painted the background and um, I had, so I did a small study of the background from life. I did studies of this over whatever, nine months or something before I started this painting, anytime the sky would go like that. I'd run outside and paint for 20 minutes, you know, and then it would go away. And um, I put those studies together with her who I painted from life. We went through a few different outfits. That's my jacket she's wearing. Um, and um, so this was, this was really, uh, I felt like a de detective trying to find different pieces that might add up to um, a decent hole in this one. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, so it's interesting to see how you're you're handling different subjects and, you know, how you're working. And I, I think that you see I think the students get to see that uh, you can take an idea and you can add to it, you know, that you're just not being overly literal with everything by just painting just exactly what you're seeing. But you have a way of putting uh, elements together that make uh, the painting uh, uh, more interesting as far as I'm concerned. You know? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's, you know, who wants to look at everyday life? We've already got everyday life, right? You know, we want to see your ideas. Do we want to see your thoughts? You, the artist. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's that, what you're interested in. Yeah. And I, I, and today, you know, you really shared that with us. There are just a few more questions I got to ask you before we're done. Let's do uh, it. And that is, um, uh, what do you feel is important in a work of your students? Um, so, A, the fundamentals enough to make it believable, you know, to make the viewer believe it. Um, the, the old cliche is show, don't tell. Um, you know, I, I, I want to see accurate drawing and, um, you know, a, a, an understanding of value so that the darks are darker than the lights and the shadows are, are darker than the lights and color that's in harmony, you know, so that um, the red stop sign is redder than the red of her nose, you know, which is redder than the green in her cheek, um, which isn't as green as the green of her jacket, you know, um, all of those fundamentals, see them, see them at least, uh, you know, match up. But then uh, exactly what you were just talking about, you know, what is not, not necessarily the deviation from real life, although that's what I personally am interested in, but um, you know, what's the idea here? If it's a sailboat, are we painting happy, optimistic sunshine? Are we painting a, a dangerous, you know, the dangerous feel of being a, alone in the ocean uh, without anybody to come save you? Is it, is it, uh, are, are we, do we want to feel, um, you know, relaxed and peaceful in a world that's, that's so chaotic? Is it something else entirely? Is it totally abstract that that the reason we don't have words for it and we don't need them because this is, you know, we paint. That's why we paint. You know, is it is it an investigation into color? I mean, what is it that interests you, the artist, about that sailboat other than 
well, somebody handed me this picture of a sailboat that we took on vacation. I need something to paint, so I might as well paint this. You know, that's what I'm interested from my students is what are, is what are they interested in? Mm -hmm. Well, you do a lot of work from life with your students. You don't do a lot of work from photos. Do you? I mean, now with the virtual stuff, we have to. But, uh, you know, when you were teaching at Glen Echo, everything was from life as far as yeah, I Yeah, I think it's the best way to learn. And virtually now, what I'm doing is we're doing master studies. I don't want to work from photos. It's just not as good a way to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of creating works of art to sign and put on a wall, uh, a lot of times, we, you know, depending on what we're trying to do, we have to work from photos. But in terms of learning and making progress and getting better and furthering our talent level, working from photos is not the way to do it. So we're working from master studies, and I'm learning a ton in there, just, just dissecting these paintings from whether it's Sargent or Waterhouse, or we did one by Giuseppe de Rivera, uh, who paints an awful lot like Caravaggio. And uh, my goodness, so just investigating that for a couple of weeks while uh, while trying to learn how the artist works and internalize their process, I think is so valuable. So um, I'm really in my classes, I'm focused on 100% on helping my students learn. I'm not interested at all in, um, in them painting good paintings. I mean, obviously, if they do it, I love seeing it, and, you know, and, and I'm happy to talk about it. And I'm happy to talk about style and everything. But I'm really just trying to help them learn. Um, and uh, so that they can go off and do whatever they want. And you know the the popularity of your classes. I mean, this is one of the things that I can say. Uh, you know, you've been teaching for me. How many years do you think it is now? Do you think it's like twenty? Um, almost. It was two thousand and four that you invited me to come teach at the Elevar. Okay, so I mean, and your and your your popularity has grown and grown and grown, and you continue to uh, attract more and more students. And I think this is one of the things that anybody who's watching this video will get uh, an understanding that, you know, you bring your own way of looking at things, uh, you know, through your work to your students, but at the same time, you really uh, work hard to develop them in a personal way. Otherwise they wouldn't be coming back and working with you more and more as, as we have seen. So I think this is, uh, this is one of the unique uh, qualities about you is being able to work with, uh, uh, with students. Uh, Speak in terms of the beginning student. Do you do you have any, uh, uh, you know, if someone was interested in taking your class, do you think that they think of your class as being for more experienced students, or how do you? What do you? Think? I always have loads of beginners in my classes, and I always have people contacting me and asking me if uh, they can take my class if they're a beginner. And I always tell them the same thing, which is that um, beginners and um, you know, artists with a great deal of experience make all of the same mistakes. And they're the same mistakes that I make um, consistently to this day. It's just that we make them to different degrees. And with experience, you develop the ability to see those mistakes as they're happening rather than um, missing them. But uh, that's why I, I love working with beginners and people with a lot of experience um, uh, so that we can you know, identify those those kind of cardinal mistakes and um, and just work on it. It's a process, and if you learn the process, um, uh, you'll understand, and it will make sense. And and drawing, and you'll at least understand what you're trying to do. And then the more you do, obviously, the more you'll be able to do it. Yeah, but well, it's just the language. Anybody who's in, who's watching this video, you've really gotten an opportunity to uh, really see uh, Gavin Glacus and uh, see what he's about. And I think this is one of the great uh, opportunities now with uh, Zoom to be able to do these uh, personal interviews, which I think is, has worked out really well. Um, I, I feel that, uh, Gavin, you've done a remarkable job and, uh, you know, looking forward to uh, seeing more of what you do. And I know that students will be interested in taking your classes. So, well, Walt, I have you to thank for so much of everything that I've always done, and and um, as I really, really appreciate everything. Well, you're you're so welcome. All right, well, folks, uh, we're going to end this interview. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, go to the yellowbarnstudio.com website, and you can uh, uh, go to instructors, and uh, you'll see information on Gavin and and Gavin's courses and how to get in touch with him. All right. Thanks well, for everything. Well, and please shoot me an email, any of you, if you have questions about anything. Um, I'm always happy to talk to you about it. So.